this is a chance for everybody to engage with the panelists. And Kelly, where is Kelly? There you are. Thank you. Do you, I appreciate you coming up. And just in terms of some of the themes around which we could focus our questions, I'd suggest this. What more can we do than we are doing today to shift the culture and improve our response to bullying? How should schools deal with bullying behavior most appropriately? What is appropriate discipline? Accountabil is it accountability? Is it restorative justice? Where on that spectrum do we deal with bullies best. And um, we're also going to be ex uh, welcoming questions via Twitter um, and uh, over the uh, and through Facebook right now as well. So let's open it up. Comments, questions for our panelists. Hands up. Go ahead. Okay, my first comment, I had spoken to uh, Teresa earlier in her session and what I wanted to know in regards to the online bullying reporting, when that report goes out there, who's on the other end that's responsible for then taking action in dealing with the report? And how do you decide what is most urgent at hand? And I'm sure this is going to be a really successful tool because I wish I had it when I was in high school. Um, but when the demand does get overwhelming, because this is going to take off, because this is a new route for people to um, take charge of what's happening in their lives, but still do it where they have, um, they can do it anonymously. So I want to know when you have an excessive demand, how is this program uh, equipped to deal with that? And would you be open to people like myself who work with youth, and we are youth ourselves, to be trained in um, uh, being the people who are going out there and then dealing with these reports of bullying? Teresa. Um, I think I'm going to turn this over to uh, Minister McRae because I haven't been closely involved with the rollout of the reporting tool. Thank you very much and good question. And, and until it actually rolls out and we see it in use, we're not 100% sure as to how many people will embrace it. In, in some ways, you want it to be overly successful because that means that people are, are annoying about it and using it. On the other hand, it also reflects a problem in our society. School districts will have, on average, about three individuals who are the <coughs> safe school coordinators. And then from that, they'll have to sort of clearinghouse it out to the people they feel best uh, based on their training who can deal with circumstances. Obviously, if there's life uh, at risk, you know, it would go probably to the police firstly. Uh, but right now, we have a lot of principals and superintendents who are actually pretty good at making sure they can triage down to the individuals who would best handle it. Uh, police obviously are very busy doing their day-to-day -day work. However, this is something like it was mentioned by the officers. This is a crime. And, and police officers have to react accordingly when it is that situation. The website will continue to evolve and make sure that it is responsive to the needs of our young people. That's the most important thing. Go ahead. In, 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 I'm sorry, I can't see names from here. Yeah. Uh, it's Manpreet. Um, just, uh, you know, you just said that it's a criminal act and uh, Sergeant, uh, um, I, I can't. Yeah, Frank Policelli. He said that, yeah, like when you, you kind of underreact because you're just calling it all bullying, is it more helpful to call it what it is, like if it's blackmail or extortion or, you know, to use those terms rather than just bullying because it's become so normalized as a term now? Who'd like to take that one on? Teresa? Yes, uh, thank you. I think that's one of the most important points, as I was referencing this morning, is that uh, I think that the re reference term of bullying has become common language, which has almost allowed certain behaviors to become what I refer to as soft language. And I think we very clearly have to do a better job of uh, assessing and calling the behavior what it is. And that in has included uh, blatant underreaction to situations that would meet the, the test for the criminal code. So I think it's important and imperative uh, that we're very clear in how we assess and respond to these behaviors and identifying the behaviors as they are. Go, uh, you know, before actually before we go to the next, I, I do want to answer a little bit, add to Dawn's answer to the first question there about the online reporting tool. First, I was, I, it's, it shows my um, lack of nerdiness, Dave, that I confused an app with an online reporting tool. We deliberately didn't build it as an app because we don't want young people to be walking around with an app on their Blackberry or their smartphone, have a bully pick it up and say, you've got the rat app. So we made it an online reporting tool where people can access it online. That's the first thing. The second thing is it is, it is entirely possible that we could end up with many, many more reports than we're prepared for. The system is set up so that the 
uh, Safe Schools Coordinator will receive the anonymous report and then we'll provide that report to administration at the local school in context and again anonymously. If there isn't a follow-up on the report or if it hasn't been dealt with quickly, they will automatically receive a prompt at the Safe School Coordinator's office. What will happen ultimately is schools that are getting a lot of reports or schools where there isn't, uh, there isn't a prompt response are going to get um, follow-up action very quickly from that. So we'll be able to be we'll be able to support the schools that really need the support that aren't able uh, or don't have the tools to deal with bullying um, as quickly or as well as obviously they need to. So we're trying to build the system in recognition, you know, recognizing that not every school is up to the same um, level of being able to deal with this, and we may end up with more reports than uh, than we expect, and um, we may end up needing to evolve and change the system because it's really important that kids, when they report, know that there's going to be a response. It ha they have to know it's anonymous and therefore it's safe, and second, they have to have confidence that there is going to be a response. Otherwise, they won't bother reporting. Those are t essential at the beginning in this. So uh, thanks, thanks for asking that, I apologize. Did you wanna? I, I just have a quick comment. Um, in regards to the safe school coordinators, so I have a sister who's in high school right now and you know, with her experience, it's always that teachers can only do so much. They're responsible for teaching their classes, extracurricular activities, and all the other things that go into being a teacher. And in terms of being a safe school coordinator, how can one, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is there an option for other people to be trained as safe school coordinators that maybe aren't teachers within the school? Like Absolutely. other youth that maybe have graduated or even are in older grades? There are, um, there are lots of ways that other people can support what schools are doing. And I mean, there are good examples of schools that are doing a fantastic job at that. Some of the students from some of those schools are here today. Um, but the, for, the, the thing about the safe schools coordinator is that they have undergone very specific training and it has to be anonymous, or at least there has to be the guarantee of anonymity if a young person wants that. So I think we do need to be cautious about who we include in that circle of trust. And, um, and they're also, the Safe Schools Coordinator also has to be able to provide the information to the administration in the appropriate context. Because they may be speaking with a principal, vice principal, school counselor, teacher, who doesn't necessarily have all of the background and context about bullying that they need. Those are really essential pieces of it. So yes, it's important we can include more people, and I think we should. The bigger we build that foundation, the better. But I do think that we need to make sure that the safe school coordinators are really the people that have the core training. So go ahead. Um, okay, I've got a lot of people. I'm going to take the lady, the woman in the first row, then the woman two behind with the gray jacket, and then we're gonna go there. And um, yes, dark hair, earrings, I apologize. So first, the woman hi. in the front. Yeah, Anita Roberts. Oh, hi, Anita. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Um, I uh, am the founder of Safe Teen. It's a BC-based uh, violence prevention program. It's been in the schools for more than two decades. Uh, Barbara, we, you talked briefly in your um, session about the importance of skills. I love the uh, vision of Erase. I love the idea that kids are going to have a safe place to report. And um, I am grateful, deeply grateful, for what you've created, all of you. Um, and in the meantime, because we're not going to erase this very quickly, uh, it's going to take some time, um, what are the kids going to do to navigate those moments all day long every single day? So can you speak to the importance of skills, Barbara? You spoke so eloquently, eloquently in, your, um, in, in the breakout session, even to the point where you were saying, here are some of the things kids can say. And that's what we do in Safe Teen, and I just think it's a huge missing piece. Uh, thank you, Anita. I, I it is critical that we um, do certain things when a kid's been targeted. One, we say to them, I hear you, I'm here for you, I believe you, you're not in this alone. Kids are isolated, they feel, uh, bullies tend to do that, that's what they want to do, they isolate the targeted kid, and they want them not to be believed. Again, and when it's a high status social bully doing it, we are less likely to believe the kid who's been targeted. So we have to say, I hear you, I'm here for you. The next thing we have to say, it's not your fault, it's their problem, not yours. The third, and, and it's critical, is there are things you can do. And that's where we have to empower kids who've been targeted so they don't succumb to the bullying. And since verbal bullying is the most common form, then we have to give them some good lines. And I would caution you here, 
as I mentioned in my uh, small group, there are programs out there that don't serve our kids well. For instance, there's one program that says, tell uh, the bully, please stop, that hurts. Oh, that'll work. Um, there's another one where you're supposed to thank the bully for making you a stronger person. I object to that tremendously. Uh, there's another one that says ignore or avoid the bully. The bullies will find you, and it's hard to ignore. It's like don't think of the elephant, you think of the elephant. And so we have to give kids good lines. Since verbal bullying is the most common, we start with that, with tools. And one of the lines, in case you're at, oh, wondering, for those of you who are in my session, I apologize for the redundancy here, to say that was mean, that was cruel. Not, notice not you're bullying me. That was mean, that was cruel, that was bigoted, that was racist, that was sexist. You identify the behavior and then say, I don't need this, I'm out of here. Teaching kids to take care of themselves. Another good line, especially for you older teens and for adults in this room who may be targeted, that comment was beneath both of us, which says I'm not getting in the mud with you and inviting you to be bigger. Also giving them self-talk if they're afraid to say something. Many of you confronted didn't know what to say. Or your words, even though you were eloquent, your words didn't come at that point when you're being targeted. Um, is to say to yourself as you're walking away, self-talk, I'm a decent, caring human being. She's sure getting her needs met in a lousy way. Putting again the problem back where it belongs on the person doing the targeting. And, and I also recommend that we give targeted kids the opportunity, as James Natchway, the wonderful Canadian, said, do good because good is good to do giving targeted kids the opportunity to get out of themselves and to do good for other human beings because it's one of the best ways to heal the harm and the hurt. Uh, not put them on an anti-bullying committee because that sometimes just reaffirms that hurt. But to say to them, uh, you know, what are you doing? Are you at a soup kitchen, Habitat for Humanity? Giving them those kinds of tools. It's so important that we don't allow anyone in our school to succumb to the bullying. We may not be able to erase it totally right at the beginning, but not to succumb to the mean and cruel. That's when we run the risk of self-harm and harming others. I'd like to add one more piece to that, um, in, and that is, you know, we can't give the kids all the right lines, but we can give them suggestions and have them brainstorm what, you know, what might Absolutely. work. Absolutely. I think what, really, I feel so passionately about this, what we need to do is we need to cultivate the core strength of our kids uh, so that they can resource the inner wise woman, as we call it in our program, or the solid guy in the boys program, so that they can come up with their own wise things to say, because they have that wisdom, and uh, we can introduce the, uh, that part of them um, they, we can um, help them unveil that part of themselves and they can resource that wisdom and they can speak up uh, for what they believe in without violence. And I, I think that is just so, so hugely important. I've given my life to it. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. In in the back. Yes. I just had a question about um, the prevention. And first off, thank you so much with your comments about how creating schools where compassion is the norm. I think for parents, it is what our goal is for our kids. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the Take You Out of Bullying and the resource guide. I think it's a huge opportunity, and I was wondering if there were any plans to include parent and student leaders in that process, because I think that's taking some, oh, something that's coming from top down and really making it a groundswell, and, and that would be, it's, the reinforcement, when you can reinforce something at home and within the community, mm -hmm. that's when you're gonna get the uptake from our mm -hmm. kids. Teresa. Yeah, thank you. And again, this goes back, to Anita, to your point. I think the, the take you out of bullying because it is a role play resource, which does actually capture exactly, I actually even feel better about the work that's been done sitting in this room today going, oh good, if we did get that right. Um, but the reality is, is it is reinforcing uh, that language and the role play and giving those kids the inner voice and the way we want them to respond to the behavior. Um, but as the training, the array strategy training has been delivered in all of the school communities, uh, the school teams themselves are strongly encouraged to go back to their schools. We're doing the education in relationship to the four types of bullying through the Take You Out of Bullying resource and strongly encouraged to ensure that they follow through with that, that parent piece. Of course, we're not can't make it a thou shall, but it's strongly encouraged it, and it's based on research where we've seen it work. Uh, we've seen parents be more likely to come in and see their students, th their children perform, as opposed to come in and listen to a school administrator or an SLO talk about bullying or cyberbullying. So we do know that we'll have that groundswell, if you will, as long as we all, in all of our school communities that are engaged in the array strategy, participate and see that follow through. Can I just respond? Oops. Yep. 
I think that I guess what I'm saying is we are seeing though in a lot of our communities that do have parent presentations on bullying, there is uptake with parents who are leaders in their community. You can get hundreds of parents out who are willing to take that on and be more than just an observer of a presentation, but really help facilitate that within the mm -hmm. school culture. And I think if you have parent leaders who talk to other parents, parents don't just talk to parents outside the classroom. They talk to parents at work. They talk to parents at the soccer field, in the hockey arena, and changing the culture and and the language that we use, I think, is going to make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. just yes, go ahead, Kelly. Can I jump in on this one? Just because um, when I was putting down that my lived experience, my lived experience is actually as a parent and, and a founder of two organizations that um, connect to families and parents around mental health. And to me, this, this is profoundly a mental health issue. Um, and I think that anything that is done in schools needs to be translated to our homes. Um, the greatest things that we have found where parents are benefiting and able to be part of the solution is when we do things and we connect. There's a connectedness between home and school. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's tremendous relationships that need to be built between adults <laughs> in order to really um, bolster our kids. And someone, Steve Cairns is in the audience here, says no wrong adult. It's not just no wrong door. There should be no wrong adult, and there should be no wrong person eventually that we can all um, be the person that somebody needs to turn to, and we're all safe school coordinators in a sense. Thank you for that. And there we are. I wanted to thank you for um, for for this for this event, and I just wanted to mention that I am First Nations and uh, Aboriginal, and I wanted to um, to make comment about the need to have uh, culturally safe schools for our Aboriginal children um, in uh, in in British Columbia, across Canada, North America, and, and so on. But um, that it's really important to have um, safe culturally safe schools, and that quite often our um, Aboriginal people are the butt of many jokes, uh, racial uh, jokes, and uh, we suffer many of the social ills as a result of colonial colonization and legislative uh, acts that. Uh, has done great damage to our people, and I wanted to uh, to bring that forward today because I, I didn't hear it discussed in in this main room, and, and it's so vital, important to our children's future that they be respected. I see here the sign about expect respect and a safe education, and for many of our First Nations children, that's not the case. Um, from uh, from uh, you know, every every school, either on reserve or, or off reserve, and, and uh, uh, that there's um, a sense of safety that's not there for folks. And I th I'm thinking about some children in, in East Van who had a suicide pack. There was over um, oh, nearly 20 um, students who had a suicide pack, an Aboriginal um, suicide pack, and how that's just a totally uh, um, shocking and, and appalling and how um, we need to have more respect put into the classroom and, and from the teachers as well. Um, my daughter was a student at uh, um, Nutka Elementary and uh, had suffered uh, some very uh, racial slurs that were mentioned in the classroom from the teacher. And then a student at Van Tech and there was another racial slur um, that was mentioned from another teacher there um, using the n-word and how um, that shouldn't be permitted um, our, our children of color need to be respected wherever they are wherever they walk and um, we need to we need to teach that respect and and be role models for one another and also in not only in the home but as a, as a teacher and as a principal that I think that that's really important um, and about that there's a book in in the, in the high school uh, System. I think it's a Huckleberry Finn book or, or some some book where they use the N word, and I think that book needs to be taken out of the classroom um, because uh, sometimes that N word can be used um, um, uh, inappropriately, and uh, and it needs it needs to stop. And I just. Uh, um, I want to say about erasing racism and about racism being a, a, a part of a mental illness as well, um, that we need to, uh, to address it and to stop it at home and in the school and on the street, on the bus, um, everywhere. I work in health care and that's one of the things that we're looking at now as uh, First Nations people looking at uh, 
access to health care, and one of, the, one of the things we're looking at addressing is cultural competency and how we need to start do, doing, uh, teaching children about respect at every, um, every age level within the school system and kindergarten all the way up through high school and post-secondary. So I know that now the teachers are, are teaching some First Nations stuff within the, within the UBC curriculum, but I think that needs to happen at each and every grade level. So thank you for listening. Thank you for that, Diana. Teresa wanted to speak to that. Sorry, I just really want to thank you for your comments. And I, I did reference this morning that as we're talking about the array strategy, when we talk about one of the levels of training that has been rolled out, it is, it's not just about the bullying. And I referenced this morning talking about diversity mm. and the reality, we do talk about it. We, and we thank talk you. about homophobia, racism, but also mm. importantly, systemic racism. And you know, I challenge folks in the rooms because we do have to check our and challenge our own personal biases. Uh, systemic racism, absolutely hearing from the stakeholder groups, it is alive and well. And I think we do have to check our own personal biases. Mm -hmm. And I, I say that as a professional, but also as a, a foster parent of a, a First Nation student of seven years. <laughs> we experienced it. it, it is alive and well. Mm -hmm. And I can mm -hmm. assure mm -hmm. you that it is part of the overall race mm -hmm. strategy and it's an important part. Thank, Thank you. Thank yes. you for that. Go ahead in the white blouse, second row. Thank you. I just wanted to comment that the online tool is, is wonderful, and I'm just wondering what safeguards will be put in place uh, to ensure the sustainability for the online tool in the future, and also how will the uh, Provincial uh, Ministry of Education be going about ensuring that each district is making all their schools aware of it? I can answer the first half of that, um, which is we are going to continue to evolve it within the ministry. So you, if when you talk about sustainability, I think you mean making sure that it continues to work over a, that there's always that backup there, that there's always, it's not just a reporting tool, that there actually is someone who's going to take action at the back end, right? I was meaning more specifically like over the years yeah. to make sure no matter who's the Minister of Education or who's the current political party to ensure that that website will always be there? Well, I mean, I can, I can only, I can speak for, for, for me and I can tell you this, I'm passionately committed to this and we are going to make this a part of everything that we do in the Ministry of Education and we're going to do everything we can to try and grow it outside of education, outside of schools, to the community, to parents, uh, to workplaces as well as well. I mean, it's a it's a matter of political will. We've got it, but we need to make sure that we're 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 migrating that into the into school districts as well. One pro D day every year that's going to be devoted to bullying training. So that's going to that will we hope always exist. Don signed the order today. That training will be ongoing and sustainable. I hope forever until some. You know, I mean, hopefully no one will decide to reverse that decision. We're going to integrate it into the training that students get in teacher training at university. Hopefully that will be a long-term part of, of that. I mean, all we can do is to try and ensure that that training is something that's always happening in the long term and really build it into the system so that it's hard to pull out. That's what we're trying to do here. Um, you know, and make sure that the staff are in districts and are devoted to following up those reports when they see them. So I, th um, okay, second row from the back, there we are. No, yeah, that one, that's right. Just push your button. Yeah, um, I'm Bonnie Leidbeater, I'm the evaluator for the WITS programs oh. and um, delighted with the response here, with the enthusiasm, delight just to witness the groundswell of um, expertise and uh, at all levels, students, parents, um, and all, all the way up. Um, really exciting. I have um, one question that I've been wondering through this is um, about the reporting tool. Um, one is how do we, how do we anticipate um, the, the bullies taking it over? How do we anticipate false reports? And also, how do, what happens once you've been uh, filtered through the system. Is there a suite of interventions? Are we thinking restorative justice? Are we thinking disciplinary actions? Like, what are we going to do with this? Um, and I think it's really essential to have that in advance in a way so that kids know if they make a report, 
these are the kind of responses that could occur. Mm -hmm. The other thing I hear a little bit here, it's my role as a psychologist, is a little disconnect between what the youth are saying about it matters on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, it's a problem with my identity, I feel embarrassed, I'm depressed, and the more, um, I don't know, uh, higher level response, which is terribly necessary too, to um, preventing illegal acts, basically. How do we reconcile those needs, and how do we fund those needs? And it's very let, complicated. Let yeah. me ask Teresa to speak to that, because you've been going through the training. Yeah, I can just speak to, uh, I'm gonna actually shift hats here for a minute to answer your first uh, question in regards to the reporting tool. Um, there's no doubt, and I look forward to working with the ministry representatives in the rollout and implementation of the tool, because if it's done the right way and not the wrong way, uh, this can be a very, very valuable and important tool. And I can just speak to an initiative that uh, I developed six years ago, uh, almost seven years ago now, with in partnership actually with uh, the two important gentlemen sitting in front of me, Sergeant Policelli and Corporal Newman, because it's important that this is done in partnership. And we developed it uh, in partnership, and I can tell you that in the last uh, three and a half years, we've not received one false report. But it takes commitment, it takes a lot of ongoing conversations, the strategy of what we're communicating out there so that this isn't just uh, ratfink.com, that this is based, built on wanting those cries for help answered uh, and those interventions provided. So I, Bonnie, I loved your reference to that suite of interventions because the reality, that is what occurs. We get good information um, and we're actually able to confirm. First and foremost, we have to ensure that it's not a criminal code offense because it's a criminal code offense at that point in time. You've got to make sure it's actually not going off to your school per personnel for the integrity of the police investigation. Um, but if it, if it is th those reports that we receive in relationship to uh, from targets, uh, we're also now getting kids that will send us direct links to um, suicidal ideation posted online, all the things that we want. But it took a while for the kids to see it work. The kids needed to see a process working, providing that level of support that they needed. And I have to say, one of the most exciting things that occurred for, for me last year was seeing us trend the other way. Last year was the first year that uh, we proceeded beyond 50% of those reports. So we launched it as an anonymous reporting tool six years ago. But as of last year, more than half of the reports came in as individuals who were prepared to provide their identity to mm -hmm. us or the police. That is huge because one of the biggest issues facing our society and our schools right now is this code of sil mm -hmm. silence. And we could talk about uh, for a long time our hypotheses as to why that is. But if you talk to police, it's an issue. It's an issue for us in schools where we're saying, folks, we will respond. We just need the information. So in that regard, I think um, if this is done well and if it's done the right way, I think you'll see something that is very effective and you won't see uh, the levels of uh, false reporting that other websites in North America, there's a lot of talk about false reporting. If it's done the right way, it doesn't need to be uh, turn out that way. Barbara. Yes, uh, I would like to go a step beyond that as well. And one of the th things I find universally is that we put a great program in place, that's the three Ps, strong anti-bullying policy. But the second one is critical, procedures in place to help keep the target safe and empower them, keep any bystander who's a witness, resistor, and defender empowered and anonymous. But the next step is that we hold bullies accountable. And I make a distinction between mistakes, mischief, and may mayhem. All, all bullying is mayhem. It's never a mistake. Oops, I didn't mean to call him that name. It's never mischief, it's always mayhem. Now there are degrees of mayhem, but it's always mayhem and I believe we have to treat it as such. Because if we don't, it doesn't matter what kind of programs we have in place for reporting, if kids don't see it being handled effectively, where we're rewriting the script for the bully, but also holding them highly accountable for what they did, and if it reaches a criminal level, that it's dealt with at that level as well. And um, I think it has to be an overarching part of an entire discipline procedure in the school. For, I'll give you very quick, a mistake. You run out of class, your felt it marker lid fell off, you mark up a wall. That's a mistake. Own it, fix it, learn from it, move on. Kid does tic-tac-toe on a wall, that's mischief. Show them what they've done wrong, give them ownership of the problem, give them ways to solve it, leave their dignity intact. Another kid writes a kid's name in a gross term. These are all markings on the wall. But that's mayhem and need to be treated that way. And if we don't see it that way and we don't handle it immediately that way, we won't get much reporting. And so it's critical that that piece be in place 
it, within the whole province that we all say as educators, and I am an educator, that if a kid writes a kid's name on the wall, it is not like an accidental marking and it's not like tic-tac-toe. And we will hold them highly accountable for the behavior. And that's where restorative justice, I believe, fits in. Restitution, resolution, and reconciliation. Own it, fix it, learn from it, and, and heal with the person you've harmed. Yeah. Go ahead. No, you keep, every time I point at you, you look behind you, but I mean you. <laughs> I really wasn't sure. Okay, so um, I'm a co-president for the Burnaby District Student Advisory Council. Yeah. And I was wondering, with um, great progressive policies and programs such as this one, there's a lot of hype at the beginning, but I'm wondering how you will continue to um, reinforce the ethics and procedures of this program, and also how you will um, get this message and these um, resources um, such as the website where you can report bullying um, out to students who aren't here because um, a lot of the students who will be aware of this program are the people who are very involved in extracurricular activities at their school and that's like a very very small proportion mm -hmm. of students and so I'm wondering how you'll get the word out to students who aren't aren't as active in their schools and uh, fall at the wayside usually for programs like mm -hmm. these. Mm -hmm. Good question. And it's, it, similar questions have been posed, I think, today. So, you know, training 15,000 educators this year, a pro D day every year, embedding anti-bullying content into, into our education for teachers and educators across the province, a safe school coordinator in every single district who will deal with this, the online reporting tool um, so that you know, young people can access it. And we've got someone in Teresa Campbell who is eminently experienced at making this actually work sustainably over a period of time. But students is your yes. question. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, one of the things that we are, we're talking about is doing a, is putting together a student summit. Now, the challenge with that is how do we make sure we just don't get the mm -hmm. student leaders who are all the, the good, compassionate kids who are really concerned about supporting other children. And I said, and I mentioned this to Barbara, and Barbara said to me, the thing about bullies is that they have natural leadership skills, but they don't use them well. Mm -hmm. So how do we get those kids in a room with all the kids that are here today and ask them to change the way they use their leadership skills? Mm -hmm. That's the challenge that we have that we're trying to sort through. Yeah, because um, at, at our own school, I was thinking that we could, instead of just continually grabbing the same representatives that may be here today as well, um, grabbing people who are leaders within their own social groups and before we can do that we need to um, teachers and adults within um, schools need to recognize that there are social divides and that there are social groups and that's the most important part I think and then once we can do that I think just finding the leaders within these social groups from every grade and then bringing them together that's so important. So, yeah. Absolutely that's good advice. Okay so it with the dark hair Hi. Actually, I have two questions. One is with the website and the reporting. What are the what's the time frame that you're looking at? So once a report goes through, are we looking at you know a response within a week or a couple weeks? Like a day for a child who's being bullying is it's a long time. <laughs> right. And it, I think it depends on the nature of the report, Teresa. It and if someone is if someone sees somebody being harmed right then, we are hopefully going to be able to get a police response to the school immediately, right? Yes, and I, again, uh, I look forward to uh, further engagement with ministry staff. I can just again speak from uh, my experience with our tool. The nature of the information that comes comes forth uh, is dependent on the, the time response. That being said, the attempt is to respond immediately. It always should be, regardless of the nature of behavior, because somebody, I refer to it as that cry for help. Somebody has referenced it. We want to be as immediate as possible. Um, and the reporting tool is, is basically uh, covered basically throughout the school hours. So there is that responsiveness that's built in. It doesn't matter where I am uh, or colleagues of mine in the District of Surrey, um, I get it wherever I am. It's, it's, the reality is we also get it 24 seven and occasionally there are reports that come in on the weekend and I don't say, hey, guess what? It's, uh, it's after four o'clock on Friday, I'm not working. I work with committed individuals and I think everybody in this room are committed individuals, but uh, I can just assure that it'll be quite timely dependent on the nature of the report. 
Okay, thank you. And I just had one more question. Because we, we just saw how there's pictures of children posted on Facebook and stuff. So for example, our children aren't allowed to have Facebook because they're 10 and under. But there are children who have iPhones. Like for example, my eight-year-old had pictures of t him taken and posted on other people's Facebooks. Is there any legislation or laws or protection that's going to be established to protect children from having pictures of them at their face in the toilet being posted? Or is that impossible? I, I think if you want to, <clears throat> if you want to go quite broadly on it, there is an article in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, actually, that obligates us to protect children against uh, attacks against their um, reputation. Um, the difficulty that you're going to run into th with things like Facebook is that Facebook servers are in the United States and they're subject to United States law, and we have no um, we have no way of regulating them at all because they're outside of our country. So, so pressure, pressure. Pressure. We can. You can certainly lobby, and you can certainly uh, attempt to appeal to Mr. Zuckerberg's empathy. I'm not sure if it's as developed as most 14-year-olds. <laughs> nice. um, my name is Mary Zilba, and um, last week I held a um, town hall meeting. A lot of the um, panel is here today, and one of the things that it's that came up is we had quite a bit of students there, and one of the things that kept coming up was the fact that children don't celebrate each other's differences. And one of the ideas that we had that is kind of basic that might be a great initiative is doing something called a reach week or reach out week where children have to spend a week of their time getting to know their neighbors. And that means doing a school activity with someone they don't know, um, having lunch with someone that they don't know, doing an, um, a sporting activity, something with other children that are not of their ethnicity, their religion, um, just celebrating each other's differences and realizing that perhaps those kids actually are really great kids and, and have a right to be, you know, you're sharing friendships beyond your group. Um, so that is one of the ideas that had come up and it's very basic, but maybe something that it, it's kind of preventative Rather, we're dealing with the issues here, but maybe if kids started uh, getting to know each other um, in different social circles and celebrating each other's differences, it maybe wouldn't have as much bullying. And um, two of the kids actually spoke at our event um, that one was a bully, and he stood up and spoke. And tomorrow, he will be on breakfast television speaking about how he bullied. Um, it happened to be my son, actually. He was, he was bullying my son. but. Um, they will both be on breakfast television talking about it. And one of the things he said is that he wanted to be in a different group. He didn't want it. My son wanted to be a friend with him, and he didn't want to be friends with him because he wasn't cool and he had a medical disorder, and so he bullied him. So now he's, he likes him, but it took a long time for him to get to that point. So it's just a comment to say that maybe we also have to implement some ways of, of maybe educators having children get to know each other a week in the beginning of a school year so that maybe there isn't so much um, discrimination. Thank you for that, that one, Mary. I'm going to keep moving here. I've got Levi. Is it Levi Fox? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Levi Fox, and I'm uh, obviously um, a student at Vic High, so from the island. Um, and I have a few concerns. It was also directed at the website. Um, I don't know how many people here would know about them, but they're what um, our generation calls trolls. Yeah. So they could, I don't know how many of you know them, but um, they're generally very negative, um, but they'll go and think it's fun to say make uh, false accusations on the website, and then that could get somebody in a lot of trouble because they haven't done anything. Um, but there are these accusations. And also, I noticed that in one of the presentations, uh, you said bullying is intentionally causing pain uh, for the pleasure of another individual. And I don't think that that's entirely true. I think that a lot of bullies are completely unaware that they are bullies. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they just, they don't feel like they're bullying people. And it's a very unconscious process. Thank you for that, Levi. Barbara, can, you, can I ask you to speak to that? Oh, and then, and Jay? I speak to that. Um, yeah, um, Trevor over there actually was um, speaking to a bunch of points that I wanted to address. That's because, <clears throat> A, I think if we're going to need to like impl implement that, that 
reporting tool that we're also going to need to find a way to discipline the people who abuse the power of that of that reporting tool to like you know falsify claims because I know I know from experience that there are people who you know get off on doing that in fact like I mean I've seen some of my brother's peers and stuff you know partake in that kind of thing so like <clears throat> when it's implemented I think it's crucial that it be that um, the people know that like <clears throat> you know abusing its power and everything will should result in like serious consequence like maybe even like you know some kind of federal consequence or something like that I'm not sure exactly but that's one thing I wanted to speak on. And the other thing I wanted to speak on was about, yeah, like, stuff like unconscious bullying. And because, like, to me, bullying and social crimes are really all a matter of perception because I know, because I remember I look at what I was like in grade, like, seven and what, I w and what I'm like now. And in grade seven, I didn't really understand, like, you know, Th like things like, you know, occasional like teasing and stuff as social norms. So sometimes I would, you know, interpret like things that weren't intended to be harmful as hurtful things that, you know, led me to think like self-deprecatingly about myself. So really one of the things that I think is crucial for parents and students to do is to encourage kids to become, co like to become conscious of how they affect the world around them. See. Like even even like when they make a little like you know teasing comment, thinking about like how it affects that person, look for like little subliminal like you know little subliminal hints like you know what like what the person's face looks like after. Think about how could that be harmful? Is that just a teasing thing? They seem does it seem to be good natured, or am I doing a good thing for somebody like that? So uh, yeah. Thank you for that, Barbara. Could yeah. you speak to the definition yes. of bullying? Yes, and I, I work on that very hard all over the world because if we don't understand what it is, how are we going to deal with it? And and Jay, you you express that so well. If we are not aware, you say that it's unconscious. But if we are swimming in a culture of mean, it becomes the norm. And if we don't discern the difference between teasing and taunting, Jay and I can tease one another. Uh, and it's it's two-sided. He teases me, I tease him. It's mutual. Taunting, I attack him, and all my buddies join in. There, it's no slippery slope. I'm getting pleasure, and if I'm swimming in that culture, I mean, I see nothing wrong with getting pleasure from his pain. It's raising that awareness that I make a difference. I can harm him. So when people say to me, I, I, I didn't mean it. Now, to say, um, let's see, what would be, um, oh, to Jew someone down. Any Jews in here? Not a good thing to say. But it's not bullying. It's ignorance. Somebody needs to pull me aside and say, let's talk about stereotypes here. To pull someone, I, I, I did that off the res. Boy, he went off the res. For somebody to pull me aside and say, you know, that hey, those comments have a, an intolerance and bigotry and prejudice behind it. That's not bullying, but I, I need to stop it. Uh, to gyp someone, referring to gypsies. That's ignorance for many of us. But if I use a bigoted comment thinly disguised as a joke, that's taunting, and it is bullying. Taunting is bullying. Teasing, have you ever made a mistake, though? I say, have you ever, at the wrong time, wrong place, said something to a good friend, but if I would say something to Jay, meaning it lighthearted, and his face went blank or sad, what would I do if I was his friend? I would stop. Or sometimes I put my foot in further, <laughs> and, and he'd have to recover me <laughs> and say, you know what, I understand, Barb. What would a bully do if his face went blank or he had a tear in his eye? Keep it up. So it's very easy to discern the difference between teasing and taunting by how I respond when he is hurt. And so I think it's teaching kids the difference. But if you, you're right, if you're swimming in a culture of mean where it's the norm to target other kids and get pleasure from it, you begin to see that, oh, I didn't mean it, and yet it's mean, and it has to be stopped. I've got uh, in, the, in the front, yep, and then the back. Um, my name's Karen, and I was a youth facilitator with the Beyond the Heart program with the Red Cross as 
well as a lot of other youth in this room. Um, what my understanding is that the erase bullying strategy equips adults with the edu education about intervention. So how to step in on a bullying situation, how to create um, healthy schools. Um, what my question is, is how does the erase bullying strategy equip youth with the education or the training to then train other students? So with the Beyond the Hurt program, um, a lot of youth in this room, as well as myself, uh, have worked with other youth and given them the knowledge on how to intervene. How does the erase bullying strategy do that? There is on the website um, a big section for youth as well, so it's not just in intended to equip adult, it's also intended to equip youth. Um, Teresa, I don't know if you want to speak to some of the other uh, training that's going on. Yeah, just to, again, coming back to the take you out of bullying strategy, that is really training for those individuals, including SLOs, police officers, to come back and make sure that they're delivering that to the youth. Um, so that's imperative that that is part of the process. And that being said, the array strategy, uh, we don't the Respect Ed program I'm a huge supporter of. So the Erase Strategy, we are still embracing all of those wonderful programs that work in the province of British Columbia. So I, I definitely didn't come in and develop a new training. I actually point people in the direction of those programs that might work wonderfully well for their, their communities uh, and Respect Ed being one of those and Safe Teen being another one. So uh, generally those references, we were not reinventing the wheel. And on Twitter, we got a number of people that asked a question similar to this. How much of the summit's feedback will be added to the website for improvement? Are you listening to the feedback? The answer is that is the purpose of the summit. So for example, Mary Zilba's comment is something that we can, you know, we'll think about, we'll take with us, and we will add that in to our strategy. That's what this is about. How do we improve what we're trying to, what we're already doing here? So thank you for that question. In the back corner. Uh, my name is David Butler. I'm a teacher here in Vancouver, but I'm representing the BC Teachers Federation today uh, in their act, uh, Committee for Action on Social Justice. I sit with the uh, LGBTQ committee. I thought it was uh, somewhat Thanks. appropriate. Today in the, uh, the metro, there's a story of um, a gay man that was assault, um, verbally threatened twice at the, the YMCA over the weekend, once on Saturday. And uh, the same um, um, perpetrator returned on Sunday and they saw each other in the locker room to, uh, and they, the assault continued. And the person, the person, the assault, the, the, the assailant didn't lose his membership. So I, I was thinking about um, the culture of safety because I had a conversation with Diana uh, over lunch about um, uh, cultures of safety, uh, schools being safe places for people, for all people. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I went to the interior to do a workshop on anti-homophobia education to a bunch of um, high school teachers. And I was quite surprised when a principal asked me, um, we were talking about bringing in literature in high schools, maybe um, there's a, a famous book about two young women who fall in love in New York City, they're both 17. It's a uh, um, you know, renowned story and it could be read in a grade 12 li literature class. The principal said, well, but what if, a t what if a parent comes in and is really upset that I have such material in the class? Like, what do I say or what do I do? And I'm looking at the principal thinking, but if it was a novel about an interracial couple and someone was coming in because they were freaking out that, you know, there was an interrace love story, you wouldn't even give that person the time of day. Like, you wouldn't even consider that position because it's not part of the school's mission statement of being an inclusive place. Why are we honoring homophobia? Like, why, why? So the message I got from the teacher is the teachers don't even know that they really need to be clear about the values of the school system because they're worried. They're really afraid. And if teachers are afraid to deal with homophobia, we're not sending a very good message to the students when they're all also asked to, to do the same thing. Thank you for that, David. I, um, I'm going to, because you've, it, there you are, okay. Now you've had your hand up for a long time. We're going to have to make this the very last comment, question, piece of feedback. Thank you so much. Uh, my question was that living in a multicultural society, uh, I have no doubts that this is gonna be a successful a program because your passion behind it and the room full of people that want to see the change. So that's awesome, but is there any plans or can we expect this to be also available in other languages that are you know here? 
that is one. And the second one is we still have a couple generations that are still excited. I know parents that are excited themselves, oh, I have a Facebook account. So they're still struggling with the online. So not everybody is tech savvy. So is there going to be pamphlets and written um, uh, data available that we can put at community centers or um, even at libraries and stuff? Uh, last but not the least, what do you think about having some sort of mandatory self-development self classes within the school system? Those were my two points. Mandatory self-development classes. Um, what do you mean by that? What you, specifically are you talking about? I'm actually going to pass it to Navi. Oh, okay. Um, so this is actually a question that I also had is because a lot of you spoke on this, Barb, you said that we need to raise um, children with compassion because that's values that we often forget through life. And the workshops that I teach, we base them around teaching youth that belongingness is the first step. And I feel that's where hatred and ignorance and bullying comes from. It's a lack of um, belonging or a sense of belonging with your peers. Um, and what I wanted to know is similar workshops to what we teach, which are based around something that Mary said, reach out um, and spending time with others that are different from you, uh, based in meditation, yoga, spirituality, community outreach. Is there a way for us to implement that in our school system here? Barbara, can I ask you to speak to that? You've looked all over the world and seen what works. Uh, anytime you say mandatory, people get their ire up. But I really believe where we've seen it, we had an issue with yoga in Colorado by some groups that really bucked it, even though it was very effective. So they came around in the back door and taught uh, animal zoo moves. Uh, <laughs> and they had to call it that until it got embedded. And once it was embedded, then the language was acceptable. And I think rather than mandatory, um, to have programs begin like yours does and being willing to spread it out, get the word out there. The, the government cannot do it all, um, but they can certainly help um, channel it and help support it. But it's got to be activists like people in this room that say, um, this works. Let's show how it works here. And then just as you're doing the online thing, you're doing it in small places first and working out the kinks. And we now have a very active yoga program in many of our schools. But I got to tell you, to make it mandatory at first, it would not have worked. But then to bring it in and, and get it to be a very successful and show how safe schools creating more calm, peaceful environments and accepting environments works and reduces not only uh, bullying, but reduces all kinds of self-harm and violence in the schools, then you can spread that. Uh, I know Safe Teens, you were started very small, and it has now spread. And I believe that's going to have to be part of what goes on. And I, I, that's the energy of this group, the energy of each one of you in here, to be able to make it work. But you know you have your, a minister uh, and a premier here who says, uh, we're committed to it. And that, that's what brought me here, was the excitement that the, the um, government wants to make a difference and is willing to jump in, but can't do it alone. Barbara, thanks very much. And Merlin? Just a, just a final comment on education for uh, techno-intimidated adults. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Solos, we go out and do that in the schools. There's online curriculum and resources. Uh, it really is triage education. We're, we have a gap in time now where we're going to have to speed everybody up. It's going to unfold more naturally when we get five or ten years down the road. I believe that it will be much more easier to integrate and we'll understand the dynamics. But at this point, we do need to get roll out education and really shake up and, uh, and get parents involved as much as possible.